Thank you. We're going to get started with our lunch presentation. OK. Um, again, for those of you coming in, please make sure to grab a feedback form. Um, you can submit to the RSVP desk up at the front by the elevators. Uh, my name is Soma Zabuali. I'm here at USIP. Um, for those of you who have participated in our morning panels, um, I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as we have as we try to understand and explore this field a little bit more. Um, I've been practicing traditional karate for about 13 years, which is a Japanese form of martial arts. Um, I am a five-time um, national champion as well as an international um, competitor. Uh, I've, I've competed at the world level, at um, Pan American levels, and um, most of my medals are gold, so that's nice. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, anyways, uh, my, through my athletic experiences, um, I've come to realize that sports is a factor, is a common factor among everyone. It's a universal thing. It's, it'll always be here. It'll never go away. Um, and it, it's a common factor despite age, ability, gender, um, you, know, you name it. Uh, contrary to how martial arts might be portrayed, um, it is rooted in prevention in terms of building and sustaining peace within oneself and through that being able to transfer it to your, to your environment as well as those within your environment. Um, this, this, um, this has led me to my experiences as well as this philosophy has led me to analyze and uh, try to understand a little bit more the, um, how martial arts as well as sports can be used for building peace around the world. My hope is that the inclusive capability of sports uh, will mobilize international efforts to, in order to create peace. Uh, this inclusive nature includes embracing those with disabilities, a common occurrence that war and conflict affected individuals and children face. Uh, Mr. Hubner is the chief of Paralympics and uh, for the US Olympic Committee. Um, I have great enthusiasm for his presentation as I'm sure everyone else here does too. And uh, I guess without any further delay, Mr. Hubner. Thank you. I'd like to uh, just thank the U.S. Institute of Peace for, uh, for having me today. Um, I think I know a little bit about peace building. I'm a, from a family of six. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> learn everything at home. <laughs> um, and uh, my, my comments today uh, are going to be focused specifically on Paralympics. And uh, a lot of it with the domestic, uh, domestic tactics and, and strategies that, and, and maybe not even using the word peace, but I think when we look at outcomes, and I deal with this every day, um, I think there's some, some tactics and strategies in there that can help us all work together more collaboratively to, uh, to come to an outcome. Um, First of all, just on the U.S. Olympic Committee, we're very unique. We're one of only four National Olympic Committees in the world that also operate and manage the Paralympic program. And it's my duty, as my communications people tell me all the time, to remind you that the Paralympic program is for athletes with physical and or visual disabilities. Thank you, Eli. You can report back that I've done my duty today. <laughs> um, so that makes us unique. Um, we have a pretty significant brand. Um, and I've heard just in a couple of the other panels today. Um, you know, our brand, and we do brand research quarterly, um, is arguably one of the most powerful brands in the world. It's influential. Uh, it's, it's deemed very positive um, by not only people in the United States, but people around the world. And it gives us a pretty significant platform. We have a pretty significant infrastructure. Um, more than 50 organizations are members of the U.S. Olympic Committee. Uh, from USA Swimming to USA Hockey to the National Recreation and Parks Association to military organizations, touching more than 50 million Americans in thousands of U.S. communities. The Olympic movement, and this is where we diverge a little bit in terms of strategies and different strategies, the Olympic movement, initial focus was peace. And a lot of folks that have been tied to the Olympic movement remember in 1936, two young men that reached out to each other, one German, one American, Jesse Owens and Lutz Long, who uh, 
probably, in just a simple gesture, promoted peace throughout the world in a way that most people couldn't. But it was the incredible platform of the Olympic Games that, that allowed for that to happen. What's unique about the Paralympic movement, and this is why I have multiple personalities, the Olympic movement um, was a result of uh, a peace mission. Paralympic movement was an outcome of war. Um, initial focus on rehabilitation of injured service members after World War II, and that's where the movement started. What's unique within the U.S. Olympic Committee and uh, our role on the Olympic side is really to work with partner agencies, USA Swimming, USA Hockey, and our national governing body family to prepare teams to go to the games. And on the Olympic side, a lot of those entities are involved in the grassroots initiatives and the youth initiatives. On the Paralympic side, it's a little bit different. We are the national governing body for track cycling and swimming in the United States. We run the programs. I have coaches on my staff. We also partner with national governing bodies to implement 21 other Paralympic programs. But we also, and a lot of people don't realize this, a lot of times when you talk about the Olympic or Paralympic movement, you think about elite sport, competitive sport. We in the United States are also focused on the other end of that, getting kids with physical or visual disabilities involved in daily physical activity, getting them involved in programs, not competitive, learning to have fun, introducing injured military personnel, sport how to run with your five-year-old son in your backyard, not how to go to the Paralympic Games. So on the Paralympic side within the U.S. Olympic Committee, we're involved in both. We're involved in the grassroots identification and inclusion of persons with physical or visual disabilities and physical activity. We're also involved in developing the team that goes to the Games and represents the United States at the elite level. Just some programs, and again, most of these are coming from a, a Paralympic perspective. I just want to emphasize that. Um, and, and I think as we get to outcomes, you'll hopefully see where some connections to what the subject matter today is. One of the key initiatives for us as the U.S. Olympic Committee, using that incredible platform and brand that we have, is to engage leaders to shape policy. Very important on the Paralympic side fact that there's a lack of programming in the United States for kids with physical and or visual disabilities. Not, again, to go to the Paralympic Games, to just simply play with their friends in their backyards and communities all over the United States, to be physically active. Our brand and our platform gives us a great opportunity to have that discussion with leaders at all levels, at the local level, at the regional level, and at the national level. And that's something we we utilize um, because we want to be a thought leader. We want to be at the table. And when I say we, key critical point, when I say we, I'm not just talking about the U.S. Olympic Committee because we are partnering with agencies all over this country to help implement programs. So I just want to emphasize that point that the U.S. Olympic Committee are organizations like Tacoma Parks and Rec, Blaze Sports, Disabled Sports USA, uh, big and small all over the country that we are using our platform and this is a learning and, and listening to earlier today a learning a takeaway we got groups coming to us every single day every single day and we just we can't handle you know a hundred people calling us daily as to how we work with the US Olympic Committee so we based on feedback from numerous organizations around the country decided to take a leadership role in flipping that around and bringing people to the table to discuss how we can work together collaboratively to address an issue. And, and that's critical. As we all fight for resources, absolutely was critical for us as the U.S. Olympic Committee. And we were, we were asked to take that role by different community and national government leaders, program leaders. We were asked to use our platform to take that role. From a community perspective, I, I mentioned we send teams to the game, but from a community's perspective, in the last two years we've developed 126 Paralympic sport programs in 126 communities in the United States. Our goal is to be in 250 communities by 2012, with an emphasis on not building Paralympic teams, <coughs> but an emphasis on developing programs so kids could be physically active at the community level or the school level. Pretty significant military program. That's, that's where we came from. Um, the Department of Defense and Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, and I, I remember about seven years ago sitting in a meeting, and again, a little bit of the dialogue earlier. 
sitting in a meeting with about 20 different organizations, all with their elbows out, fighting for the same piece of the pie. And the U.S. Olympic Committee was in that meeting. And I'm lo looking at generals and, you know, admirals and everybody else. And any time I go to the Pentagon, which I'm there often, I always laugh as to why is a U.S. Olympic Committee person sitting in this meeting. <laughs> but a role that we want to play and have been asked to play is to be that neutral partner that can hopefully get past the turf and talk about how do we collectively move forward. So today we have programs at 40 military installations around the United States providing technical assistance, expertise, and support for injured service members coming home to be physically active as part of their rehab. And I'll take a jump domestically to internationally, and, and I'll take a couple other jumps as I conclude um, as to where does this fit into the subject matter of today. Um, just last week at one of our programs, Israel, Great Britain, Canada, um, Australia participated, bringing, sending people over to get support and technical assistance from us on how to go back and, and train people back in their, their countries to support this newly injured population. Internationally, you can see this picture. Uh, we've delved into that space, although our priorities have been to really develop our domestic programs. And even though the Paralympic movement has been around for more than 40 years, 50 years, the US, until really our governance reform in 2004 when Paralympic became part of our mission statement, the United States has not had one entity focused on building the Paralympic movement until I would say 2005 when our governance reformed. So this is pretty much our infancy and we are developing domestic programs that hopefully we can take our learnings and, and explore internationally. And we have done that. Our Paralympic experience, and in this photo, you'll see a Paralympic youth camp. No competition, I love what Nina said. No competition in terms of what we're doing with some of our youth programs. It's about experiential learning. It's about teaching young kids with a physical disability to dream. To go to Athens, Greece, to go to Beijing, China, and be at the Great Wall. 15-year-old kid in a wheelchair at the Great Wall of China. And what we've done is, is with that program, we've slowly began to expand our horizons um, based on our priorities. And now we've invited other countries to participate in that program. Because one of the things that we feel is so important is the, are those international relationships that we want to develop with young Americans that can go around the world and, uh, and meet kids from Germany, kids from other countries. Um, and, and our two programs are Paralympic Experience where we take Americans to the games, American kids that promote ability to the games, and we've connected with other national Paralympic committees to make sure we create experiential learning at the games, no competition. Um, but also, last year we partnered with Turkey and eight other countries to create a Paralympic youth program. Again, focused on international relations and building relationships and dreaming. So our outcomes, and this is kind of where we get back to peace, and I love the evaluation discussion because we were in an executive team meeting last week talking about our 2011 performance screen and trying to evaluate international relations is trying to evaluate peace or trying to evaluate a lot of different things. It's a, it's a pretty, hefty, pretty hefty subject as to how do you really evaluate the importance of relationships. Um, but this has been key, and I think my purpose today was to be thought-provoking. How do we engage leadership? My whole life, it seems like I've been on the prevention side of any business I've been in, and as all of you that are in the prevention world know, you're always scrapping for, for resources. Um, so how do you provoke leadership? How do you provoke thought leaders? How do you provoke policy decision makers to say, yes, this is important, this is impactful, this is making a difference? And uh, my boss yells at me all the time because our business is to win medals at the games and develop sport <coughs> programming. So when I start talking about the impact of physical activity on health, on secondary medical conditions, on employment, on higher achievement levels in education, he gets ready to throw me out of the room. <laughs> but it's very important in the space that I live in. And I see the outcomes every day. And we pulled together a research consortium that we don't want to lead. We don't want to get involved in another evaluation or research study. There's enough of it out there. We've tried to just pull a group together of people doing that and utilize the specifics that they're focused on and also talk about, hey, there's a really need to really look at the health impact of physical activity on people with physical disabilities. Can you take that on? 
So the research is there, it shows it. I see it every day with 17, 18 year old kids at our Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs who I would argue have too much self-esteem. Um, guess if you're number one in the world, you should. <laughs> But, uh, but are talking about college, are talking about jobs, are talking about making a difference. And this young lady from the University of Illinois just returned from Ghana on her own and did an did a international relations project there, um, teaching, kids, um, teaching kids to participate in sport. Um, that's an outcome that we might not be steering. And similar to what Jesse Owens um, and Lutz Long did in 1936, but we have a platform to assist with the collaboration and assist with developing a plan. And that's a role that we are playing in the Paralympic space. Um, I would argue that uh, program availability, a healthier population, a more educated and employed population, um, and some international outreach would help the peace throughout the world. Um, seeing in 1990, Iraq and Iran march in together at the World Championships, Paralympic World Championships, was pretty phenomenal. And seeing yesterday, the timing of, uh, of this session was perfect because last night on CNN, there was a, just a great story about um, Iraqi rowers on the, on the Charles um, with USA Rowing, one of our member organizations, with our Paralympic Sport Club in Boston, with members of our military program, um, all together on the River Charles rowing. Um, and that, that's an outcome that hopefully we can assist and play a role in in terms of really trying to identify how you measure that. And <laughs> good luck. Um, but, but, um, but also be a player in sitting down with leaders. And, uh, and I leave with that note and I'll open it up for any questions. Um, you know, our, our role in, in trying to facilitate leadership, and I, I'm seeing this every day domestically, and I'll give you a story about Chicago. We went into Chicago, which was a pilot project for us, and there were 20 some odd organizations, the same thing, all fighting for the same resources. And by getting the leaders together in that community and in Beijing, China, over a two and a half to three week period, talking about the need, talking about the problem, and strategizing a plan, came back and announced a program in December of 2008 that today, has more than 23 organizations working together to grow the resource pie. And, and what I mean by that, a lot of people go to finances, um, but what I mean by that is to identify kids, to collaborate on programming, and to increase resources. We were able to triple the amount of resources available for all those programs by collaborating. And a billion dollar trust fund in Chicago said by leveraging the national relationship and platform of the US Olympic Committee with the 23 programs collaborating locally, is powerful and we will write a check to support that. So I, I leave you with that point because in listening this morning, obviously that's a challenge for all of us and working with a lot of our military installations. In Colorado Springs alone, we have a major army base where more than 100 organizations every day knock on their door asking how can we help. Somewhat overwhelming at times for an entity like that. So the more we can talk about in sessions like this, how can we collaborate, leverage some key platforms, to engage leader, leadership and show some great outcomes, I think will help in, in this space, driving policy leaders to make change. Um, and with that, I'll uh, set the format, open it up for any questions. Any softball questions? <laughs> this is a sport group, right? No? OK, great, thanks. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll open it up. Um, so you mentioned, so you mentioned collaboration. You mentioned a lot of people come in asking for help. So what is something, what, what can those people who come saying, what can we do for help? I mean, how can we utilize that desire, that initiative to come forward and ask that question? Um, unfortunately for weather in Chicago, you're going to get a postcard from me sometime today, hopefully. Um, one of the things that we did, and it was based on sitting with a group of leaders in the space that we work in, is we, we had an innovation summit in 2007 in Chicago, brought 40 different leaders from all different entities together. And out of that, we had a plan, we had a strategic plan in place, but out of that took that input and put it against that plan. One of the things that group asked us to do was use our platform to lead. 
Um, and we are doing that in the Paralympic space. And the first thing we did was we created a national leadership conference to share best practices and talk about key initiatives. By the way, in 2011, the two primary initiatives based on feedback from our constituents all over the country are how to increase your revenue. Um, <laughs> simple subject for everybody, right? And identification. But we created that because we wanted to get thought leaders together. And, and the postcard that hopefully you'll have today, and if not, we can get an email out to all of you with our website. It's just www.usparalympics.org, is a national leadership conference to talk about subjects. And I could envision this subject, you know, even though we have our priorities and developing our programs are our number one priorities, I could envision convening a group of people, and especially the space that we're in. Uh, Rwanda right now is one of the leading teams in Paralympic sport. Uh, Iraq and Iran, leading teams in specific Paralympic sports. Um, I could envision helping to facilitate a conversation under the Paralympic umbrella in this space, possibly as part of that leadership conference, but we've also expanded now to eight regional conferences around the country where we're bringing thought leaders together about primary topics of, of what are important in the Paralympic movement. And, and this subject matter fits into that space. And again, it, it might not be a direct, direct, as mentioned, I don't think I used the word peace in my presentation, but when you talk about availability of programming, education, employment, um, those are things that I think lead to peace. And, and a lot of what we do, it, it's not direct. My job isn't to get people with physical disabilities employed, but it is an outcome from what we do using our incredibly powerful platform to do it. So um, one, one opportunity is potentially our national conference and, and talking about maybe creating a specific subject matter as part of that. It, it's, a, it's a conference with national leaders and speakers um, not only from our government, from, uh, but from all over the world. Uh, Coach K was our keynote this past year um, and who, who you know, can talk about a lot of different subjects at a, at a very high level. Questions? Can you speak, speak, up, speak up. Yes, sir. Hi. Eli, your questions are always too tough for me. <laughs> Take it easy on me today, would you? No, I'm just, I'm just, I was a Paralympic athlete myself in the sport of soccer, and I'm just really interested in learning more about the, um, the program, the military program, particularly in terms of what that process is like for folks as they come back and do the rehabilitation process, and kind of what you have seen in the role that sport has played, and kind of how these folks do talk about coming out of a, a war torn area or whatnot. Yeah, uh, I'll briefly answer that. And I, I thought somebody made a great comment earlier. Sport doesn't do everything in the world. I understand that. I mean, not everybody is interested in sport, but you know, Invictus is on HBO right now. It's just a great platform for how you can use an incredible platform, and that's what we have. We have an unbelievable platform. I'm very aware of the great fortune I have and our team has on a daily basis to work for the U.S. Olympic Committee. We have an incredible platform. Um, for, for my world, and I, whether it's in a community in Denver where a 17-year-old kid who was a wrestler was in a car accident and lost his legs, or another community where a six-year-old young man had a brain tumor and became totally blind, or a 25-year-old kid went to Afghanistan and came home as a double amputee. We see it every single day. It is the simple things that allow you to jump back into life. And simple things for that 17-year-old in Denver was he wanted to play sports. He was a wrestler. The simple thing for that six-year-old kid was he wanted to ride his bike. Not at an elite level, he just wanted to play. He wanted to ride his bike. And that 25-year-old, although he made our Paralympic team, his first thought when he became injured was his ability to run with his five-year-old son in his backyard. So sport plays, uh, I, I would argue, living this every day. I think the support network is probably more impactful Sport plays an incredible jumping point for somebody to realize and their support net network to realize that everything is going to be okay. You can still go skiing with your buddies. You can get a job. You can go to school. And if you have the talent and want to make a commitment, you can represent your country again. Um, and that, our, our role in the military program, we have programming at 40 different military installations. We're developing community programming all over the country. So when somebody comes home to Colorado Springs, they have a program that they can go to in Colorado Springs and they don't have to drive three hours to the mountains. And our program is focused on physical activity. It's not focused on elite competition. 
It's focused on getting physically active with your family and your friends, knowing that you know 10% of the population will ever make an Olympic or Paralympic team. Um, so the primary focus of all of our programs. And as we continue to st take steps internationally, same concept, we're working with the International Paralympic Committee and we're strategically starting to do some things in that space, but our highest priority, and I'll be honest, is domestically right now. We're in our infancy and we need to develop our programs domestically because if we have a very strong Paralympic program in the United States, we can help the IPC develop a very strong Paralympic program around the world. And, uh, you know, I, I, I believe very strongly we have a national event called the Warrior Games, which we just hosted for the first time this past year. It's an event that has created great support from leadership at all levels of our government because of the impact it's having for young men and women to return to their lives. But uh, a, a dream for me, when you're really talking about jumping into the, the space that we're talking about today, someday at that event to see not only it being U.S. athletes, but athletes from <laughs> Afghanistan and Iraq and other places around the world at that event would be pretty powerful, and I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility whatsoever. Yes, sir. Um, yes, I'm Dodge Fielding. Uh, I manage a program called Score for Peace at the Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy. Um, President Obama uh, recently, maybe a year or so ago, tasked NASA to make a special outreach to the Muslim countries. My question is, is that something that the Olympic slash Paralympic Committee is also doing? Is You mentioned a lot of countries that are Arabic speaking. Um, is there a special focus on, on, on the Arab world? No, uh, not, not really. I mean, we're, uh, we right now, and again, our, our primary focus has been domestic in the Paralympic space, um, but we no doubt are having conversations with some key areas of the world. Our first priority are the Americas. I mean, there's, there's in South America and Central America, a, a great need, programmatic need in, the, in those countries, and it, it is our, you know, how we're set up as the Olympic and Paralympic movement. You start kind of in your own space. But we have had outreach with the National Paralympic Committee of Afghanistan, um, of Iraq, and we're having discussions as to how we can support. And then from the military perspective, a lot of our allies have come to us um, and, and asking for support. So there hasn't been any specific focus in those areas, but we are, have ongoing dialogue and understanding where there's some great areas of need. Um, we want to be open to that discussion, and if appropriate, and if we have resources to focus on it, um, be supportive in that space. May I do a follow-up? Yes, sir. Um, Libya, <coughs> excuse me, has a enormously proactive um, Paralympic uh, program. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi has been committed to this for many, many years, and one of the really good things that he's done in the, in the world is to serve the Excellent point. And, uh, you know, that, that you make a great point. My mother always told me, you know, first and foremost, be open to learning. Uh, we are in no way, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're providing technical assistance and expertise, but at the same time, we're listening to other countries around the world. And, and that is the role we've been asked to play, and I'll close with that. Using this incredible platform, and you think about this too as well, all over the world with National Olympic Committees and National Paralympic Committees going to them in a way that is not overwhelming and talking about how you can partner to use their national platforms to, to reach an outcome. Um, and that would be my two, two bits of advice is, um, you know, that, that is impactful and it, it, it's, it's happening here in the United States and some countries are coming to us and asking for technical assistance. We're also going to other countries and, and asking for the same, but thinking about how you can approach that and if you can approach it collaboratively much easier for those entities um, to be able to possibly come back with a response of, yeah, we'd be willing to jump into this space. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. We're going to take a quick break for about 10 minutes, so see you then.